Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Tonight I would like to clear up some theology concerning our future, the future of a Christian, and not necessarily just what happens when you die, but what happens from this point on for a born-again believer until the end of eternity. And the Bible clearly tells us what's going to happen. I know that many people feel so incomplete in this life. And even Christians feel incomplete. And there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is simply this. No matter how many accomplishments you've made, no matter how great of a level that you attain, you'll never feel completely accomplished because you weren't created for this life. You were created for an eternal life, a spiritual life, a step above this one. And we need to understand that Christians, those of us who are born again, we move from this level of glory to this level of glory to this level of glory, and every level is a step up. There is never a step down. We should never be concerned about how people who have passed away, who have departed, we shouldn't feel sorry for them. No, 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 no. We need to focus more on their gain more than our loss. Yes, we'll miss them for a while, but the reality is they're just a few steps ahead of us. And they are actually, I know people say this, but it's true, they are in a better place. And given the choice, they're not going to come back. They're not gonna, they don't want to step from this level of glory back down to this level of glory. There's a certain glory we walk in now as born-again believers. We have the Spirit of the living God living inside of us, and He is never going to leave us. For all eternity, we will have the Spirit of the living God within us. But each step of glory is better than the step before. So if we were created for eternity, then what are the steps that we take to get to eternity? And there's seven basic steps. Now, there's a lot of things that you could talk about and break down and have subcategories, but I'm talking about the steps of the believer, not the steps of the non-believer. Because when a non-believer departs, they move to a different timeline than we move to. And even like during the tribulation, most people like to talk about the tribulation and all the heck that's breaking loose here on earth how bad it is. Well, we're not going to be here. See, so I'm going to talk about our future. Not necessarily just the history of the world, but our future. So there's seven basic steps. The first one is the rapture of the church. That's our departure. The second one is the judgment seat of Christ. The next thing that will happen is, for us is the marriage supper of the Lamb. The next thing is our return with Jesus at the second coming. The next step is ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. Then the next thing is a group of events that take place at the end of the millennium. And then the final thing that we know of so far is moving into our heavenly home in the new Jerusalem. So let's take each one of these seven events and just kind of walk through them piece by piece and sort it out. I have been amazed at how many Christians don't really know about what order things are going to take place. And even ministers. I had dinner with a minister in Texas a few weeks ago of a fairly large church. And he, he said, well, some people are post-trib and some are pre-trib and some are pre-millennial, but I'm just a a pan trip. And I said, well, what's that? And he says, I just believe everything's going to pan out okay. Well, basically what he's saying is he didn't know in the Word of God how things were going to work out. But the Bible clearly tells us, step by step, where we will be. This is why you can't threaten a Christian with death. We should never be concerned about moving to the next le 
level of glory. In fact, it should be a joyous event. That's why we call it a celebration of life when somebody passes, rather than a demotion. So let's take the very first thing, is the rapture of the church. All Christians living in this dispensation of time, this age of grace, living from the time that Jesus put his blood on the altar until now, will enter into heaven, into paradise, in one of two ways. First, the Christians who die, who depart, right now, before the rapture of the church, their bodies will go into the ground, and their spirit will be escorted into the paradise of God. All of us who have loved ones, and looking around the room here, I know many of us who have had family members that have passed in the last few years. Our family members, their bodies are in the ground, decayed, scattered on the water. Who knows where their bodies are? It's irrelevant. But they're still here on the earth, and the bodies are dead. But their spirits are alive, and they are with the Lord right now. And they have a spirit body. Now, they don't have a resurrected, glorified body. That doesn't happen yet. But they have a type of a spirit body. And the Scripture tells us what kind of a body a person has when they pass and the rapture hasn't taken place yet. And it's interesting that we have senses, taste, sight, sound, feelings, memory, and the people who pass who are not Christians, they even have regret. We have an understanding of what's going on on the earth. And we have a type of a body. It's not our body we're going to have for all eternity, but it is a spirit body. Now, at the rapture, the spirits of those who have departed that we were just talking about, they will re-enter the atmosphere. They will return to this earth with Jesus and a great miracle takes place. We who are here and we are still alive, the Bible tells us that we're going to see this take place. The dead in Christ, Jesus will appear in the sky, and the dead in Christ will rise out of the ground first. Now why did I say dead in Christ? Because we're talking about the body. We're not talking about their departed spirit. We're talking about their dead body. And their body is dead. My son that passed away a couple years ago, his body is dead. He is alive, he has a spirit body, and he is with the Lord. But his body is dead. And the scripture says that the dead in Christ, that's talking about the church, those who are born again, those who receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, after, after he put the blood on the altar the day of his resurrection, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and they're going to arise into the air. And then the Bible says, we who are left, we're still here, then we get caught up in the air to be with them. Now, it doesn't say how long of a period of time goes by between the two. According to the Greek language, it could be just a little while. It could be just a few minutes. It could be much longer. But we're not told specifically. And there's several different thoughts on that. But what we do know is that we who are alive and remain are told that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. That way we don't get all freaked out when we see it happen. Okay? Now, what will happen when we're caught up into the air? Well, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. And I can't hardly read the scripture without reminding myself that that would be a, a wonderful scripture to put on the wall in the nursery at church. Behold, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Okay. Verse, moving, moving on. Verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now, when we are caught up into the air at the rapture, just let me say this. This is going to be the first time in history that the entire body of Christ is together at one time. I mean, that's, that's miraculous. All of the Christians, from all of those who received Jesus after he put his blood on the altar, and who is that? Well, hey, it's Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's the disciples, you know, except for Judas. It, it's all of the Christians from that point until now who believed that Jesus was the Son of God, who believed that he was Lord, who confessed that he was Lord. They were saved. They were born again. We're all going to be together in the air. Now, when you see a Christian movie and you see people caught up in the rapture, it's usually ching like out of a catapult or like out of a slingshot, you know, and they just go up into the air and arms are flailing and, you know, cigarettes and beer cans and silicones all falling out of the sky. But here's the thing. Here, here's the thing. When the scripture says, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, that's not talking about our rate of ascent. That's talking about how fast we're changed. So I personally, now this is just a personal belief, I personally believe that we are going to be caught up in the same way that Jesus ascended. In Acts chapter 1, he's talking with his, his disciples, and, and he's saying, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me. And, and he, he's talking there. And while he's talking, it says his feet start coming up from the ground, and he, he starts ascending up into the clouds, almost like the guys who are watching are, are like, uh, are you seeing that? Uh, his feet are leaving the ground. And he didn't just fly out of the sky. I mean, he ascended up into the clouds. I kind of, my personal belief is, is that's the way the resurrection is going to take place and the way the rapture is going to take place. But once we're all caught up together, then is where the scripture comes into play in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Mortality drops off, we take on immortality. Corruption drops off, we take on incorruption. And we become as he is. That's when we receive our glorified body. Wow, isn't that wonderful? Just to think about that. Hmm. So, here we are. We're all caught up in the air and the rapture has taken place. Well, what's the next thing that happens? Well, at that point, we go to heaven. Now, while we're in heaven, there's going to be two things that are going to happen. Now, on the earth, you've got to keep in mind, on the earth, that's when the tribulation starts. And that's where you read about the Antichrist and the false prophet and the beast and, and all these things. There's a lot of things taking place on the earth, but you're not there. No, you're in heaven. And the first thing that takes place is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is not to be confused with the great white throne judgment. There's two judgments involved here that the Bible talks about. The judgment seat of Christ is where Christians go. Uh, Gary Stearman calls it our exit interview. You know, it's, it's, we're, we're caught up into heaven, and we have the judgment seat of Christ, and that's for Christians. Now, the great white throne judgment takes place 1,007 years later, and that's at the end of the millennium, and that's where the unrighteous dead are judged. But at the judgment seat of Christ, that's where the Christians are judged. But in context, it's talking about, that's, in a way, it's, it's a, an award ceremony. It's where we will be judged on what we've done, and we will receive rewards. Now, I don't have time to go into it now, but I've got sev I have several pages in my book that talk about the scriptures where, where we receive rewards. It's not where we receive salvation. 
Now you need to understand this. If you make it to the judgment seat of Christ, if you are raptured and you make it to the judgment seat of Christ, you're saved. You're born again. You're in. You've made it to heaven. Okay? But there are rewards. And the rewards are based upon what you have done. Now, here's a scripture that we need to look at. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear, now this is Paul saying this, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body, okay, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now here's the thing. Salvation is not based upon what you have done. So this, this can't be talking about salvation. Salvation is based upon what he has done. And then we receive it. Now you need to understand this. Those attending the judgment seat of Christ have already received eternal life and you are already in heaven. This is, let me repeat, a judgment based on giving you rewards based upon what you have done. Paul wrote again in another place in Romans 14.10 but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand. Now, he said we. He's talking about himself and Timothy and all of his ministers he's hanging out with. He said we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So this is a good thing. Now, when you mention this, there's always somebody who goes, Oh, shucks. I don't need any reward. Just give me a little shack on the outside of heaven and I'll be happy. Now, let me tell you something. If Jesus, the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who knows you better than you know you, if he prepares something for you, he, he, he's going to prepare something that's going to be a desire of your heart and you're going to want it. So, Let's get rid of this false humility. In heaven, it's going to be wonderful to receive a reward. And every good thing comes from him. We know James 1.17 says every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father. What are the rewards? Are they tangible, spiritual? Are they a higher position in the kingdom of God? Well, let's just say this. Any gift from God is going to be a good gift, and you're going to want it. And... Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. Well, that's pretty good. You get a reward. I like rewards. When my credit card company says, You've got a reward. Click here on this order and you'll receive $15.20 off. I don't go, eh, I don't want that reward. No, I click it. We all want rewards. Take a look at this, 2 John 1.8. Look to yourselves that we do not lose these, those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Now, I, I was teaching this one time at a conference, and a young man came up to me afterwards, and he said, he said, now, I've heard you teach that when we become a Christian, we are made righteous. And that nobody is more righteous than anybody else because we all have the righteousness of Christ. So if we all have the same level of righteousness, we all have the same level of righteousness, when we go to the judgment seat of Christ why wouldn't we all just receive the same reward? Because we're all equal in that respect. God doesn't show any partiality. Well, he's right and wrong. What he said was right, except for the fact that we do not receive rewards based upon our righteousness. We receive rewards based upon our holiness. And this is where a lot of preachers get it wrong. I've heard many ministers talk about we are made holy and righteous. No, we're not made holy and righteous. 
we're made righteous. We have the righteousness of Christ Jesus. We have his, our righteousness is like filthy rags, but we receive his righteousness. We are made, you can't get any more righteous than what you are. Because you are, and I, I, this is not a sacrilege, but you are as righteous as Jesus is righteous. And the reason I say that is because that's what the Word says. We have His righteousness. Now, holiness is something different. Holiness is what we do. Now, you might put it this way. Righteousness is God's gift to us when we receive Jesus. We're made righteous. Holiness is our gift to God through obedience. So the more obedient we are to the Word, the more holy we become. And that's why the Scripture talks many times about becoming holy and working out our holiness. We don't work out our righteousness. No, you've, you've got that. You've got all there is. But we work out our holiness. Personally, I really try to believe and work at it that I'm more holy now than what I was six months ago. And I want to be more holy six months from now than I am today because it's something we continually fine-tune and work on. And our holiness is just simply our level of obedience. Doing what God says to do, don't do what He doesn't say to do. Now, you can be a marginal Christian and you can get to heaven because you received Jesus and you were made righteous, so when the trumpet toots, you shoot, and off you go, and you're in, you're in heaven. But if you haven't been obedient, then your holiness level will be a little low, and that affects what you get. Listen to what Jesus said in Revelation. He said, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. Once again, I've heard it preached, Jesus is coming back and he's got our salvation with him. No, he doesn't have our salvation with him. We've already got that. I mean, it may be news to some people, but James is already saved. And James is already living his eternal life. His eternal life doesn't start when, he's, when he departs. His eternal life started the day he received Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And so... He was living here on this earth and he received Jesus and he moved to a new level of glory because the Spirit of God moved inside of him. And that day, his eternal life started. Wow, this is good stuff. So we're in heaven. Keep in mind, on earth, the tribulation is taking place, but we're not here. We are not subject to the wrath to come. Now, what I'm giving you tonight, today, in this timeline, is the only way that all the scriptures seamlessly fit together. Now, you can take a scripture out of context, and, and you can put the rapture halfway through the tribu tribulation. You can put it at the end of the tribulation. I know of one guy that puts it at the end of the millennium and try to figure that out. I mean, you can move stuff around, and you can use a scripture out of context. But if you take the sum of the scriptures and put them all together, there's only one way that they're going to fit, unless you leave some out. You can leave some out and prove just about anything. You know, you heard of, you know what flop and drop is. That's where people take the Bible and say, God, speak to me. And Judas went and hanged himself. Yeah. Two out of three, Lord. Go thou and do likewise. Three out of five, Lord. <laughs> you know? So you, you, can't, you can't take a scripture out of context because it'll just tell you to do anything if you do that. So right after we have the judgment seat of Christ and we're all righteous and we've all received our rewards for our holiness, I call that kind of like the, the adorning of the bride. Because the next thing that's going to happen is the marriage supper of the Lamb. The church is the bride of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ is the adorning of the bride for the wedding. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, 
just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself. Why would he present her to himself? Why would he present the church to himself? Because he plans to, to get married here. A glorious church, not having a spot, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. Wow. See, in the same way that an earthly marriage between a man and a woman marks the beginning of a covenant of unity, the marriage supper of the Lamb demonstrates the eternal unity between the church and Jesus. The church right now, we are currently, according to Scripture, we are joint heirs with Jesus. But the wedding feast, at the wedding feast, is kind of where this all gets consummated and we actually take on the heirship with him. And it authorizes us to move into the millennium and rule and reign with him because now we are, we are not separate from him. We are completely intertwined with him because we are his bride. Now I know for a lot of men, they don't like to say that we are the bride of Christ. But you've got to quit looking at it from an earthly viewpoint and see it from a spiritual viewpoint, and it's an illustration of how the bride and the husband come together, and they are one. Wow. 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Wow. Our inheritance is reserved. It's sitting in heaven waiting for this marriage supper of the Lamb so that we can receive it in its fullness. You know, the Apostle uh, John prophetically wrote about the marriage and the Lamb and his wife, he said it would be complete, now listen to this, that this marriage would be complete before Jesus comes to earth at the second coming to set up his kingdom. Now, part of the reason that I'm saying this, uh, this way, is because there have been teachers who have taught that the new Jerusalem, because of a phrase in the, in the Bible, that the new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. But here's what we need to understand. The new Jerusalem does not show up until after the thousand years has ended. And the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place before the thousand years begins. So that eliminates a city. And Jesus is not going to marry buildings anyway. He's not going to marry buildings. No, he, his bride is the one he died for. In the same way as it said, husbands love your wives, in the same way that Jesus loves the church and he gave himself for her. But listen to this in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen. Now, if you're marking in your Bibles, get that. We are arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the, light, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, that's going to mean something here in a few moments. See, now, when Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure in John chapter 14, he inserted a picture of where he was going. He said, in John 14, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now his disciples, being Jewish, they had a much deeper understanding because they recognized that he was making 
reference to the customs of a Jewish wedding. In John 17, look what he said. When he was praying to the Father, and I call this the Lord's Prayer, he said, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. His desire was to be one with his body, the church. Wow. Well, the next thing that's going to happen after we are in heaven, keep in mind, tribulation has taken place here on the earth, but we are in heaven, we've had the judgment seat of Christ, we've had the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we have made ourselves ready, and we're in fine linen. The next thing is going to be our return with Jesus at the second coming. Now, it's something that you don't really hear much about. When you hear about the rapture, it's always about Jesus appearing in the sky. Well, we know now from Scripture, and we can prove it in several places, where when Jesus comes back, God will send with him those who sleep in Jesus. That's all of the departed spirits with their spirit bodies. But when we go to heaven for the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb, we have our resurrected bodies, and we are as he is. And so now when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom, his 1,000-year kingdom, we come back with him. Revelation 1-7 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Jesus said that immediately after the tribulation, the sun would be darkened, the moon would not give off its light, and stars would fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven would be shaken. In other words, there's going to be a lot of calamity going on. And after that, it says, He will send His angels to gather the elect. And in this case, and we can go through a linguistic study, but in this case, uh, the word elect is the Greek word that is used there, which comes from the same uh, root word as ecclesia, which is the church. So it says, after that, he will send out his angels and gather his elect, that's us, from one end of heaven to the other end of heaven. Well, why is he gathering us together? Because we're getting ready to return with him at the second coming. Hmm. And then he says, the Son of Man is going to come back with great power and glory. The uh, Apostle John, he, in describing a vision that he received while he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, he saw, said that he saw heaven opened. He says, there was a white horse, and uh, the one who sat on the horse was named Faithful and True. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He was clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. As he rode, and this is why in John 1, chapter 1, the book of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nothing was made that was made unless it was made by the Word. And then you drop down to verse 14 in that first chapter, and it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word of God. And His name for all eternity is going to be the Word of God. Wow, isn't that? It says, as he rode, the armies of heaven followed him. Who is the armies of heaven? Hello, that's us. And out of his mouth was a sharp sword with which he would strike the nation. And on his robe and on his thigh a name was written, King of kings, Lord of lords. Who were those following the King of kings and Lord of lords? Who was this army that came back with him? Let's take a look at this. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Now remember how the church was clothed at the marriage supper of the Lamb? Look at this. His wife was, has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. And look at verse 14 of chapter 19. And the armies in heaven, okay, 
clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Uh, many of you know that riding a horse has never been one of the great things that have happened in my life. There are many stories about me and horses, and most of them end in, well, I'm still alive, but they end in some type of disaster on the day that I was riding the horse. But Jesus has a horse for me, and I think we're going to be compatible, all right? Wow. The seven years of preparation in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb, has prepared the bride to be the army of God, to return to earth and rule and reign with him. Now, keep in mind, once again, during the tribulation, the beast and the kings of the earth will gather together to make war against the king of kings. The false prophet who works signs and wonders and the beast, they will be captured and they will be cast alive at that point at the end of the tribulation, into the lake of fire. The rest of the armies will be killed with a sword that proceeds from the mouth of the king of kings. What is the sword of the spirit that proceeds from the mouth? He, he takes care of them with his words. And we know this, he teaches us that words can build, words can destroy. Wow, praise God. So with the beast and the false prophet cast into the lake of fire and the armies of the Antichrist defeated, an angel will come down from heaven and he'll take hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, that we know as the devil and Satan, and he'll bind him and cast him into the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. Isaiah 14 Verse 15 says, Yet you will be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest parts of the pit. Those who see you will snare at you, reflecting on what has become of you. Is this the one who shook the earth, who made kingdoms tremble, who made the world a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who never opened the house of his prisoners? Well, here's the deal. When Jesus comes to earth, it's going to be Massive earthquake take place. Geologically, there's going to be changes on the earth. It will, it will be years before everything gets put back together. There will be a, a temple restored. There's going to be a thousand years of Jesus ruling and reigning over the earth with us ruling and reigning over the earth with him. In the same way that a senator in Washington, D.C. may be ruling over a state from Washington, D.C., we will be ruling over cities. But our heavenly home, our home base, is the heavenly Jerusalem. Because we have resurrected, glorified bodies. Somebody may say, well, if we're going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus here on this earth, who are we going to be ruling and reigning over? Well, that takes us to the fifth point. Ruling and reigning with Jesus during the millennium. Well, here's what we need to understand. During this 1,000-year period, after Jesus comes back at the second coming, when he comes back at the second coming, he sets up his kingdom. And many times in the Gospels, the disciples ask him, when are you going to set up your kingdom? And they were referring to what Ezekiel and Zechariah call the millennial reign of the Messiah. When is the Messiah going to show up? If you're the Messiah, when are you going to show up and when are you going to set up your kingdom? We want to know. Well, he was talking to Jewish people about setting up his eternal kingdom, his thousand-year kingdom. He wasn't talking to the church. He wasn't talking about the rapture. He's talking about when he was going to set up his kingdom. And that's what happens at the second coming. But then from that point on, Satan is bound for a thousand years. And we rule and reign with Jesus as under rulers for a thousand years. But who do we rule over? Who do we rule over? Well, you've got to keep in mind that during the tribulation, 
there's going to be things like the mark of the beast and people are, are going to be encouraged to worship the Antichrist and the false prophet. And the Bible says if they don't take the mark of the beast, then they can't buy or sell. In other words, if you don't take the mark, whatever the mark is, if you don't take it, then you're not going to be able to buy food. You're not going to be able to buy gas. People say, well, why would they need that? Because they're still living on the earth in a human body, flesh and blood. We are not flesh and blood. We're flesh and glory. But they're flesh and blood. And so if they, if they don't take that mark of the beast and they endure to the end, as Jesus said, they'll be saved. Does that mean they'll be part of the church? No, I didn't say they would be born again. I said they would be saved. We are saved and born again. But once the rapture takes place, the age of grace is over and everything reverts back to the law. And so they'll be living under the law and they'll be judged on what they do. So if they don't take the mark of the beast, if all of a sudden once the rapture takes place, they go, oh my goodness, Jesus was the Messiah. And they, they recognize that and honor that and, and worship him and instead of the false prophet and the beast. And they endure to the end when Jesus comes back with us and the Antichrist is defeated. The Bible says he's going to bring all the nations before him and he's going to separate them. And he's going to separate them in the way that a shepherd separates the goats from the sheep. And the ones who took the mark of the beast, the ones who worshipped the beast and the false prophet, they will be goats, and he'll say, get on this side of me, and they will be cast into eternal damnation in the same place that the beast and the false prophet are. They're judged and cast out. All of the others, he'll say, enter into my kingdom. So the rest of the humans on earth keep in mind we've come back in our resurrected glorified bodies like jesus has but the people on earth still have earth bodies and so they come into the millennial kingdom and they repopulate the earth and that is who we rule and reign over now in daniel chapter 2 12 verse 2 I remember one day Billy Brim and I, we were walking down the Mount of Olives and we were walking over toward Temple Mount and there were literally thousands of graves on the Mount of Olives facing Temple Mount. And uh, we got into a discussion about when was their resurrection. They were Jewish, righteous Jewish people, people who believed in the Torah, believed in, in the things that God told them to do, but they all basically lived before Jesus and so what about them? Well, we know from Hebrews chapter 11 that there are uh, people who lived before Jesus who are considered people of faith and people who are going to be in heaven. So what about these people? When is their resurrection? Well, in uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, and this is talking to the Jews. It says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame, and everlasting contempt. And if you study this out, when they are resurrected, it doesn't talk about them being resurrected into glorified bodies. They're resurrected into human bodies, much like Lazarus was when Jesus called him forth. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, Lazarus came forth in a human body. He didn't come forth in a glorified body like Jesus. He came forth in a human body. They unwrapped him, and he lived the rest of his life in a human body. Well, the, the, these who are resurrected here will be resurrected at the second coming of Jesus. When we come back, there will be a resurrection of all the righteous Jews, of all the righteous Jews, not the unrighteous Jews, but of the righteous Jews, and they will move into the millennium, and they will rule and reign on the earth out of the earthly Jerusalem. We are ruling and reigning over the earth in the, out of the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, I know this all sounds complicated, and there's literally dozens and dozens of scriptures, but I just don't have time in this lesson to give them all to you. But um, the Bible does tell us that the people who are moving to the millennial kingdom in earthly bodies will have their life extended so that, uh, 
You know, it'll be kind of like a baby will be 100 years old. I mean, it's, and the Bible talks about that, that their life will be greatly extended. Now, during the millennium is when the Scripture that says those who bless the Jews will be blessed and those who do not bless the Jews will be cursed, that is the fulfillment of that Scripture during the millennium. Because during the millennium, all of the nations of the earth will be required to give tribute to Israel at certain feasts. If they honor Israel and they do that, then the people in those nations will be able to travel to Jerusalem and they will be able to eat of the leaves of the tree of life and it will be for their healing. The Bible even describes how the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. And the implication is, is that the Jewish, the righteous Jews ruling out of Israel will have free access all the time to that if they even need it. And the Bible's not totally clear on that. So there could be a, a couple different ways that that teaching could go. However, if a nation does not honor Israel, does not give tribute to Israel during the millennium, the Bible says that it'll quit raining on their land. And that's kind of a metaphor for they're, they're going to lack in prosperity. In fact, there's even one illustration given about how Egypt, during the millennium, now it's in the Bible, it talks about how during the millennium, Egypt doesn't give honor to Israel. And because of that, they are scattered for 40 years. Finally, they repent. God brings them back. But under the millennium, people will not be living under the age of grace salvation as we know it will not be available. They will just need to give honor to the Messiah in order to have access to the tree of life. So, it's very interesting. Um, you know, the Bible doesn't give us detail of how our rulership will be. But we know this, without the influence of Satan on the earth, you know, we, we will be like Jesus. The Scripture says Jesus is going to, going to rule during the millennium with a fist of iron. As the way my grandpa would say it, he's not going to put up with any shenanigans. All right? But now, as Christians in our glorified bodies, it's kind of interesting, we are a unique group. The Bible says that for all of eternity, that this group called the church, the glorified ones. We are the only ones in all of history that we are told will have a body like Jesus. And we are not saved and born again based upon what we have done. We're saved and born again based upon what He has done. And it's, it's interesting that it says that God will say, you want to know about my grace? Let me tell you about my grace. See this group of people here called the church? They didn't deserve it. They didn't do anything for it. In the natural, they're just a bunch of knuckleheads. But because they believed in my son, I gave them the inheritance of my son, and I gave them eternal life, and I gave them a body like my son. And so for all eternity, the way the Bible puts it, we, the church, becomes the trophy of His grace. A guy came up to me later uh, at a conference one time after I'd talked something along this line, and he says, so you mean that we are Jesus' trophy wife? I said, well, I don't know. But see, Ephesians 2.6 tells us that we're seated with Christ. But nowhere in Scripture is any other group, no angels, no other created being of any type is ever mentioned as being seated with Christ. Just the church. Wow, that's powerful. Ephesians 2, 4-6 says, But God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then Ephesians 5, or excuse me, Revelation 5, 9 and 10 says, 
For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Isn't that powerful? So, we go through the millennium. Satan is bound. It doesn't say what happens to his fallen angels, the demonic spirits. Uh, they probably went into hiding someplace. But they're still around. Because we know something. As the millennium, item number six is ending the millennium. As the millennium comes to a close, there will be a rebellion on the earth. A subculture of resistance has developed on the earth. You know, there's a lot of people that only do right because if they don't do right, they get whacked. They don't do it because it's in their heart. They do it because they have to. And Jesus is ruling, according to Scripture, with a fist of iron. And there's going to be people in a thousand years. Keep in mind that our nation is only how many, how many years old? 250, 300, whatever, you know. But we're just, we're just not even, what, a fourth of the way through the millennium. And look at all the changes that have taken place since it was formed. Just imagine a thousand years and generations and generations. And there's going to be a lot of people born during the millennium who have no idea what took place during the tribulation, who may even think in terms of all of what we're going through right now in this dispensation was a fairy tale. But for some reason, there's a subculture. And how do we know that? Well, now somebody may say, well, there, there can't be any fallen angels here on the earth because they are all committed into pits of darkness. But through other writings, we know that uh, the angels uh, who committed further sins here on the earth like in Genesis chapter 6 and they mated with earth women and they sinned at the time of Noah according to 2 Peter 2.4 uh, they are committed to pits of darkness but basically there was just a couple hundred of them that did that. Well there are literally billions of angels and the Bible says one third of them fell with Lucifer so there's sufficient demonic spirits on this earth. So, you know, it's kind of interesting that uh, when Satan is released, the Bible says at the end of the millennium that he gathers together an army that is so vast, it's like the sand of the sea. You think, well, how can that be? A thousand years living under the rulership of Jesus Christ. How can that be? Well, it's really no different than Judas. Judas the disciple. He saw all the miracles. He, he saw the, the 5,000 fed from a few fish. And he had the 4,000 fed from a few fish. He saw Jesus raise people from the dead. He, I mean, he saw, he saw a lot of stuff. And then he turned his back on Jesus and betrayed him. So there's going to be a subculture. There's going to be people who are saying, I, I'm just tired of living this. I, I want to live the way I want to live. And so when Satan is released, it's real easy for him to gather together an army. But in one half of one verse, he's put away. Yeah. And he's judged. You know, it's... Uh, Keep in mind that Lucifer and his angels, they're all created beings. And how ironic it is, the Bible says that we will judge the angels. Isn't that ironic? Lucifer, why did he rebel? He rebelled because he said, I want to put my throne on the sides of the north. I want to be, he didn't say I want to replace God. He said, I want to be like God. I want to be like the God most high. I want to be like him. And basically God said, I didn't create you to be, be like me. What were angels created for? According to scriptures, uh, the scripture, they were created for two purposes. One was to worship God, and second, to minister for those who will inherit salvation. That's us. 
And so isn't it interesting that the one who wanted to be like God, according to Scripture, is going to be judged by the body of Christ who was made in the likeness and image of God. Wow. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3 says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Wow. So, at the end of the millennium, everything's taken care of. And that's where they have the, the great white throne judgment. You know, that's not us. But it says, all the unrighteous dead are resurrected. So, that means somebody who was a rejected Jesus 500 years ago, where are they now? They're dead in the ground. And their spirit is in Hades. Where are they at the rapture? Same place. Where are they at the second coming? Same place. Where, at they, where are they during the thousand year reign? Same place. But what happens at the end of the thousand years? There's a great resurrection of all of the unrighteous dead and they're taken before the Lord at the great white throne and they're judged on their works and no one's work measures up. And so they are cast out and then an exciting thing happens. And I call this the moving into our eternal home, into the new Jerusalem. Jesus said in John 14, 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So, who's he prepared a place for? That young lady right there. And that young lady. And that young lady. And that guy. He's prepared a place. And for me, he's prepared a place for us. Wow. It's difficult for us to, with our earthly minds, with our finite minds, it's difficult to comprehend an infinite God. But we can be assured of this. When the new Jerusalem descends out of heaven, and there will be a new Jerusalem, that all of creation will be in awe of its brilliance. It's going to be a magnificent thing. Now, I've heard people preach that the new Jerusalem is in heaven now. And um, there's one way to disprove that. And that is this. What we have in heaven now is the heavenly Jerusalem. And what will we have during the Tribulation in heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem. And during the millennium, what will we have in heaven? The heavenly Jerusalem. And that will be where we work out of. But then at the end of the millennium, and after all the final judgments have taken place, there will be a new heaven, a new earth. Now that word for heaven there, that's talking about atmosphere. There will be a new heaven, and a new earth, they'll be cleansed. And the word for new there is kainos, which means refurbished. So it's not a different earth. It's a refurbished earth, a refurbished atmosphere, and a refurbished Jerusalem coming down. But how do we know that that's not the Jerusalem that we have now? Well, here's the thing. During right now, we know that in heaven there is a temple in the heavenly Jerusalem. Because Jesus ascended into heaven, and he put his blood on the original Ark of the Covenant in heaven. That's what the Scripture says. And we know that during the tribulation and millennium, that there is a temple in the heavenly Jerusalem, because it talks about it. But when the new Jerusalem shows up, according to Scripture, it will have no temple. Because the sun, S-O-N, is the sun... S-U-N. The Father and the Son are its light, and there will be no need for a temple any longer. So anytime you have a heavenly Jerusalem and it talks about the temple in the heavenly Jerusalem, it's not the new Jerusalem. Because the new Jerusalem, our eventual eternal home, 
has no temple. Wow. You know, Paul said this. He said he went into paradise and he came back. And he said, it's unlawful to utter what I saw. And if you break that down in the original language, it means the words don't exist. I would really like to tell you what I saw when I went to paradise, but there are no words that adequately describe what I saw. Well, somebody may ask, what are we going to be doing during eternity? What are we going to be doing? Well, we, we know that uh, this universe that we are in, which according to the uh, Hubble telescope is 94 billion light years across, we now have this new Webb telescope that just got put online, and it's supposed to see 100 times farther than the Hubble, and what they're already finding out from the pictures is there's just more galaxies and more, more, more stars, hundreds of thousands of billions of stars that we just couldn't see before. I mean, is it possible that there's no end? See, and your brain can't think that way. Your brain thinks, well, you gotta, there's got to be an end to space at some point. I mean, if you just travel, even if you travel a t trillion years, at some point, you got to get to the edge. Well, if you get to the edge, what do you have? A brick wall? Well, then your brain is thinking, well, how thick's the brick wall? Well, if it has a thickness, then there's something on the other side of it. I mean, you cannot comprehend no end. In the same way, you can't comprehend that God did not have a beginning. You can't, you can't comprehend that. Because at some point in time, you think, well, it had to all start. No, no. What if it never started? What if it just always was? So the vastness of, of eternity is just beyond our comprehension. But I can tell you this. I can tell you where you're going to be. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Then it goes on to say this, Therefore comfort one another with these words. That's powerful. That's powerful. Now, there is no way that I could adequately cover these seven points. Um, this is not a commercial, but I will say this. We have some charts available, but these charts are in a book. They're in the book called The Paradise of God. And uh, you just have to go online and, and look for it. You can find it in our, probably on our church website. But we delve into these deeper and give a lot more scriptural references for it. So, um, with all of that said, uh, once again, I could go on and on, and I'm sure some people are thinking you already have, but to me, this is so interesting, to know where we're going to be. And the Bible clearly tells us, this is not something where it's just vague, and the more you dig into the scriptures, the more you find out how reality this is. That there's not just one or two scriptures that talk about these things. Uh, once again, a few weeks ago, Phil and I uh, were in Texas, and we were talking with a minister who said he did not believe in, in the millennium. He didn't believe it was real. He, he thought it was uh, metaphorical. And much of Ezekiel talks about the thousand-year reign of Christ. Zechariah talks about the thousand-year reign of Christ. And then when we pointed out to the minister that much of Revelation talks about the thousand years reign, the minister said, well, I don't really believe that the book of Revelation is real. See, so here's the whole thing. We, we have to... If we're going to get anything out of the Word of God, we, we have to believe that the entire Word of God is real. That it's not just true, but it's truth. And that the more we study it, the more it's revealed. And what he said, th this is not a book about mysticism. It's not a book of mythology. It's a book of reality. And if Jesus says he's coming back, 
He is coming back. And how is he coming back? The way he says he's coming back. So, repeat after me. I believe the word. Oh, yes, yes, you do. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We thank you, Father, that you reveal your word to us. We thank you, Father, that there's so much revelation. It's just layers and layers and layers of revelation. And we thank you, Father, that you are continually revealing new things. But it's all backed by your word. We love you, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen.